That'll wake you up. Good to see everybody out again this, this evening. If you are visiting with us, we would encourage you to fill out the red side of a visitor's card and send that over to the center aisle. We'd, we want to acknowledge your visit. And also our regular members, let's please try to stay in the habit of filling out an attendance card each Sunday. And if you were not here this morning, you can fill one out tonight. Remember, we mentioned that Neil Haley had a, had a good report and is at home resting. Bethany Jones begins her three-month weekly chemo treatment this Wednesday. Pamela Ross is, is home and with non-severe injuries, so that's good news. I'm sure there's a lot of emotion and, and hardship there, but we're so pleased and thankful that she is okay. So remember her also. Remember Joyce Janice, the mother-in-law of Linda, who is battling cancer. Remember Janine Crocker, who will see an oncologist this week to determine what path that they'll begin to take for her treatment. And uh, Irene Morgan, NCCU at Baptist, with some issues there. And also remember the situation with Alicia Vaughn. It is very grave. And so pray for that family and the situation that they're in at, at this time. Also now remember our blood drive uh, tomorrow, 12.30 to 5.30 here at the church and try to participate in that if there's any way that you possibly can. And please come out at 6 for the potluck on Wednesday night and Derek Yarber will be the speaker for the Wednesday night summer series. So we want to participate with that and enjoy that fellowship. At this time, Mike Darnold's going to lead us in singing, and everybody, please stand for that.
stay seated. Before we have our opening prayer tonight, we'll be singing, This is My Father's World. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> we come to you once again on this Lord's Day. Dear God, to worship you, to declare you God and creator and sustainer, dear God, and to remember your son and his sacrifice on that cross. Dear God, we give you thanks for all the many blessings you extend to us each and every day. We thank you for this congregation. We thank you for our ability to assemble and worship you. We thank you for the fellowship we enjoy one with another. Dear God, we thank you for the leadership of this church, for our elders, for the deacons, for our ministers, for our teachers, dear God, and for each and every member of this congregation who carries on their daily ministries, dear God, and we pray that you continue to bless us in all those avenues. Dear God, help us to be encouragers one to another, to truly care about one another, and to help each other along as we strive to walk in the light, dear God, and to live as Christ. Dear God, we ask that, or it is our prayer that our worship tonight will be pleasing in thy sight. All things will be done in spirit and in truth. Dear God, help us as we <clears throat> as we worship to put away any distraction and to concentrate on the message presented here, dear God, and to look for ways to apply it to our lives and in so doing grow closer to you and closer, closer to one another. Dear God, there are many in our number who are sick, who are suffering with illnesses of various types. There are also those who are spiritually wayward. Help us, dear God, to support and encourage 
each of those, dear God, and we pray that your special blessing be upon each of them as they be restored to this assembly as soon as possible. Dear God, go with us now as we as we continue in worship. Dear God, and we ask all these things through your son's name. Our scripture reading this evening comes from Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. Then said I, Ah, Lord God, behold, I cannot speak, for I am a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am a youth. For you shall go to all to whom I send you, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of their faces, for I am with you to to deliver you, says the Lord. Please be seated. Guess I can move up this way. It's good to see everybody tonight. Glad that you're here. Glad we have this opportunity for us to study together. Hope you stayed cool today. It's hot outside, isn't it? It's a very warm day. Wouldn't you know it, it's a week of camp when it does this. But anyway, that's good, because I'm in air conditioning. What I want us to do tonight in tonight's lesson is I want us to continue this morning's lesson and go into this area talking about why the nobility of man matters. Each week I put together lessons for Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Bible classes and things such as that. And what usually happens is I'll put together a lesson, then I'll look over it and I'll think, okay, that's about 45 minutes, so we better cut back, you know, because this is not going to go well. This is the lesson I put together, um, I guess it was Tuesday when I put it together. And as I was putting this and molding it and shaping it the way I wanted, I looked and it was three pages and I started adding up the verses. Generally, that's how I tell how long a, a sermon is, by looking at the verses I quote at a certain rate. And I looked, and it was an hour and a half. And I thought, uh uh-oh. So I started trimming it out and trimmed out the parts that I didn't, you know, thought I could live with that. And it was still about an hour. And I thought, okay, part A, part B. Here we go. So that's kind of what we're going to do tonight in tonight's lesson. This is part B. This is why, what we talked about this morning, why it matters. The passage, which was just read for us a little bit earlier, we we see 
the nobility of mankind. You have Jeremiah, a man who uh, is a weeping prophet, as we know. And as he is beginning his ministry, God gives him, if you will, a pep talk. He says, I knew you before you were formed in the womb. In fact, Jeremiah, I knew you even before you were conceived. I formed you in that womb. I have shaped you the way that you're shaped. I have designed you the way that you're designed. And therefore, the purpose that you have been sent out for is a purpose that you can accomplish because I made you this way. Now, sometimes hearing those sort of things will make us a touch on the nervous side because we in the uh, Lord's Church get nervous when we think about this because we compare it to what we see through the lens of denominationalism around us. There are some who believe in the idea of Calvinism. That is the idea that God made you either to be saved or to be lost. And really, anything you do cannot contribute or take away one whit from your salvation. In other words, there are some who believe that you're created in total hereditary depravity. There are some who believe that you experience unconditional election. That is, God gets to pick whoever he wants to save. And then God has condemned the rest to hell. And there's really nothing they can do one way or the other. Well, if that's the case, then there's limited atonement. Christ could have only died for a few people. Only a few people can be saved because Christ could have only died for them. And therefore, there are some who have no hope for heaven because they do not have the atonement of Christ. And that brings us to the idea of irresistible grace. That is, that Christ has saved some people. And if you're saved, you'll feel a stirring. You'll feel a movement in your heart in order for you to be saved. And you really can't fight it. You're either going to be saved or not saved. You're going to go one direction or another direction. And there's really nothing you can do to contribute one way or another. It's like you're three years old and your mama just told you to go clean your room. You can't fight it. You just might as well go do it, right? And then if those are all true, then you have the idea of perseverance of the saints or the doctrine of what we call once saved, always saved. You see, if you're lost but you are forced to be saved, then there's really nothing you can do to fight against the Spirit to ever be lost. And almost every denomination teaches some form of that Calvinistic doctrine. You have some who are called hard shell. You have some who are called soft shell. You have some that just, do you wonder about the shell anyway? But many of them kind of have some aspect of that there. And so when we think about that lens of denominationalism, we get a little bit nervous with Jeremiah chapter 1 because we see where God says, I formed you in this way and I've created you in this way and you'll go the way that I want you to go. And when you think about this, what I like to do is go back to the 1800s. I'm not quite that old, but I've read books. And you go back to the 1800s and read a uh, debate by a fellow named James A. Harding. And actually, I think we had that debate in our library. And it's about the sovereignty of God. And one thing James A. Harding talks about, and using this passage and others, is he says God is so powerful and God is so strong that yes, when I was born, he knew whether I'd go to heaven or hell. But God is so powerful and so strong that he still gives me free will. Now that's hard for us to comprehend, but that's how powerful God is. God's not going to be surprised in the day of judgment. He's not going to look down on us and think, wow, I never thought he would make it in. God knows where we're headed, but he is so powerful, he gives us free judgment. And so before God created you, he had a purpose for you. Before God formed you in the womb, he knew the wonderful, great, and majestic things that you would accomplish in life. And that's why those passages which we looked at this morning, when we look at Psalm chapter 8, We see the insignificance of man, but we see man's role upon this earth to have dominion over the creatures and have dominion over all those things that are around us. That's why when we look at Psalm 139, we see the power of God that even though we seem so weak, God created us in the womb. He formed our spines, the frame. He formed our inward parts, and he shaped us and breathed life into us so that we can be what God wants us to be. You see... We are special. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 tells us that we are God's special creation created for good works. And so we talked about that this morning. And probably if you listened in the lesson this morning, you went away feeling really good. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. God has a special plan for you. But we can't just leave it there. 
Because every lesson, if it's worth being preached, needs to be one that can be applied. And that's what I want us to do tonight, is I want us to apply the lesson and see why it's important that we recognize the nobility of mankind. Why we realize the importance of the sanctity of life and the idea that we are sanctified and made holy for God. And so in order to do that, we're going to spell out the word sanctify. And we're going to look at each letter and uh, try to look at how each letter represents a part of the nobility of man and the importance of recognizing the preciousness of life. And so when you look at the letter S, and the letter S represents to me salvation. It's going to represent that to all of us tonight because I get to preach the lesson. But if we look at that letter S, it represents salvation. Jesus Christ died on the cross for me and for you. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 10, another passage we looked at this morning, Jesus gives his purpose statement, his thesis. And he says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You see, you and I sinned, and our sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2. And so when we are in sin, we're lost. There's no one righteous, no, not one. Both you and Greek, they're all under sin, Romans 3, 9 and 10. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? Romans 3, 23. But we have opportunity to be saved. Because even though we're lost, even though we've turned away from God, there is opportunity for us to find salvation in Him. John 3.16 tells us that God so loved the world, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Jesus came to this earth not because he had to. Jesus came to this earth not because he thought it would be a cool vacation and a great trip. Jesus came to this earth because he saw the need that you and I have. And he saw that we had a debt that we could not pay, but that only that he could be the precious Lamb of God. John chapter 1 and verse 29. Therefore he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so let's think about that letter, salvation, or that word salvation, and see why it represents the sanctity of mankind. You were put here for a purpose. And if you have not yet obeyed the gospel of Christ... You've not fulfilled that purpose. Jesus already died on a cross so that you can be saved. He's already paid for your sins, whether you're lost or whether you're saved. He's already created a church, a place for you to be a part of, whether you are lost or whether you're saved. And so tonight, I implore you, as God does, 2 Corinthians 5, beginning of verse 17, looking through verse 19, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled, Unto God. Don't leave this room not ready to see the Lord. Now let's look at our next letter, the letter A. And for the letter A, I have thought of the word abortion, or also the word euthanasia. Once again, as I mentioned this morning, euthanasia is not talking about a kid in China. It's talking about how there's a habit in our society to dispose of those who are inconvenient, whether they're older, whether they're mentally handicapped, or whatever else it may be. Our country, our world, tends to dispose of people who are inconvenient. And you can judge a society by the way it treats its helpless. As you and I look at the governments of the world and the governments of the world over through times past, we can see the nobility of a government by the way it treats those to whom value is not assessed. Nazi Germany, perhaps one of the worst regimes ever created among mankind. We see the horrible Holocaust and the millions upon millions of Jews and others who were destroyed because they did not see the value of those people and des desired to have them gone. Stalin, over in Russia, through many of the purges, as you and I look through there, we see that many people died, much more than died in the Holocaust, because that communist regime saw people as property and as tools rather than as special possessions. As you and I look in China, we see even people today who are starving, even people today who are suffering because of the government. And much of it is because the government sees people as disposable tools, disposable property, rather than recognizing the value of each and every individual. And so you and I as Americans look down on these people and we say, you know, these governments are evil, these governments are wrong. 
But then we bring it to our world, our country, our place. Roe v. Wade was passed two years before, or excuse me, two months before I was born. I'm 43. And in these 43 years, we have estimated, and this is a conservative estimate, we, it has been estimated that 60 million people, 60 million babies have been aborted. That's a population, if you were to divide it, of about 13 states. Imagine how many inventors... Imagine how many workers. Imagine how many philosophers. Imagine how many people who contribute to society are now gone because they were seen to be inconvenient. Well, many people say, well, you know, look at many of the people who are aborted. They're, they're born to very poor families who have trouble with surviving anyway. Or they, they very likely were going to have some sort of disease or some sort of problem. Well, if you and I were to put that standard to the people through times past, we see that Thomas Edison was born in a very poor family. And actually abortion in his his, uh, family was actually considered before he was born. We see that many uh, Lincoln's parents also had trouble when he was born because of their extreme poverty. They thought they could not afford to raise a boy named Abe Lincoln up to maturity. And yet... Imagine or think of what he's done to help our country. And imagine the power that he had in holding our country together. Well, going back to the Bible, we see there in Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, that a child within a womb is not a fetus, it's not an embryo, it is a person. God recognized Jeremiah when he was in his mama's tummy as being an individual having personality, having a spirit, and having an individual life. Many ladies will say, well, if it's in my body, it belongs to me. Yet notice a child has a different DNA than his mother. It has a combination of his mother mother and father's DNA. And so it is an individual. A child, as it grows within its mother's belly, has an individual heartbeat and an individual circulatory system. It is an individual person. A child within his mama's belly oftentimes has a mind of its own in the way in which it moves. And it's fascinating seeing a child when, this is the only time he gets to do it, when he kicks his mama and everybody giggles, right? It's very interesting seeing a child as he is maturing within a womb and seeing how it can move on its own. In fact, we read in our Bibles, looking a little bit later, Luke chapter 1 and verse 41, where John the baptizer, Elizabeth with his mother, Uh, came and met Jesus, and Jesus was in his mother's belly as well, Mary. And as Elizabeth and Mary were talking together, John the Baptist leapt, leaped, I like to say jumped, because I can't say either one of those other words, within the belly because it recognized Jesus. Think about the implications of that. Both John the Baptizer and Jesus had personality. Both John the Baptizer and Jesus had individuality. Both John the Baptist and Jesus could recognize one another through the womb. That's fascinating to think about and fascinating to see. And we see even in the law of Moses, as you look in Exodus chapter 21, 22 through 25, had individual rights for an unborn child. Well, we could preach all day about how wrong abortion is. And we can put out these lessons and we'll really feel good about ourselves when we put these lessons out. But what is it we can do to cut down on the number of abortions? If you make it illegal, that's actually something I support, abortions will still happen. Abortions happen because young mothers are desperate. Abortions happen because of problems that are going on in society. And we as a church don't need to excuse sin, but we as a church and as a congregation need to find ways to reach out into our community and give young ladies hope, give young ladies life, and show young ladies the importance of what they have within them. That's something which is very necessary and very important. Well, as we continue along, let's look at the word in. And in talks about our neighbor, our neighbor. Now, when I use the word neighbor here, I'm not talking about the awesome people who live next to you who mow their yard and give you vegetables during the summer. I'm talking about the people who drive you crazy. 
right? Now, does anybody have neighbors like that? Don't raise your hand because your neighbors may be here at church or they may be watching a live stream. But maybe you remember or maybe you can relate to these sort of things. Our Christianity is not judged by people who are kind to us, the way we treat them. Our Christianity, actually, the litmus test is how we treat people who are unlovable. How we treat people who are awkward. How we treat people who mistreat us. In Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 43, Jesus says we're not judged by loving our neighbor when our neighbor is nice. He says even the Gentiles are nice to people who are nice to them. He says our, we are told to love our enemy. Well, how do you love your enemy? You place their needs above your own. And you do what you can to serve, and maybe this is the key word, to respect those who see things differently than you. You do what you can to recognize the breath of life and the dignity of God even within those who have mistreated you and not put you in the right standard. See, John says in John 15, 13, by this all men will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another. And so... The way that I recognize the sanctity of life is not just in salvation and it's not just in my stance on abortion and euthanasia. The way I show the sanctity of life is the way in which I treat other people. Because other people, no matter how bad they are, no matter how sinful their life is, they have the breath of God within them. And they in some way reflect a specialness of God. Even Saul of Tarsus could be converted. Even many of the Roman emperors and those in Caesar's household could be converted according to Philippians chapter 1. Even the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 could be converted. Each one of these people had major issues morality-wise, and yet those who taught them saw the nature of what they were. Next, we look at the letter C. The letter C is capital punishment. Ah, capital punishment. We see over in Genesis chapter 9, as uh, we look in this passage, we see where uh, Noah comes out of the ark and he sees the devastation that sin has wrought. And imagine how Noah felt. Seeing a world that's populated as you go into the ark and then when you're able to leave, seeing a world which is desolate. Imagine what this place must look like after being underwater for an entire year. After Hurricane Katrina, I had the opportunity to work down in New Orleans and also on the Mississippi Gulf Coast. And many of those areas have been underwater for three or four days. Some places in uh, New Orleans, because of the uh, lack of effectiveness of local government, had been underwater for almost a month. It was nasty. And it was amazing what water can do to an area over just a few days, over just a few weeks. Imagine what this world looked like after a year. Well, as Noah comes off the ark, God makes a covenant. Some people call it the first covenant. Some people call it the second covenant, depending on what you think about Adam's covenant as he made an agreement with God, or God, more correctly, made an agreement with him. And we see where God lays his bow upon the ground, that great rainbow. And we see where God tells him he is now to eat of the animals. And we see where God makes a point about the sanctity of life. Now, it sounds funny that he's making a point about the sanctity of life, but he is. And what he says is, whoever sheds man's blood, you also need to shed his blood. There we see the death penalty prescribed by God. And as you and I run into our New Testaments, we see in Romans chapter 13 that God says, our government welds a sword in a way that it should. It does not weld the sword in vain. It has the power to hold to the death penalty. And so many people look at those passages and say, man, there's a death penalty right there. The death penalty is prescribed and shown. And what God is trying to put across to us as he gives these laws, especially there in Genesis chapter 9, is the respect that we need to have for other people. There is nothing in this world worth more than life. Nothing in this world worth more than a human soul. But there are issues. We see in the Old Covenant where God made provision. 
When a person was guilty of murdering someone else, he was not to remain in prison for the next 40 or 50 years until he became a sweet old man and everybody felt sorry for him. He was to be put to death immediately. If a man killed another man and there was a question about it, he was to go to a city of refuge and have an immediate conversation with a judge in that city and a jury, well not a jury, but a trial was to be put upon immediately to determine guilt or innocence. Our government today, our legal system today, has a lot of issues. And sadly, it's a great possibility there are many people going through that process who are innocent, who perhaps will be put to death wrongly. We need to be very careful in our country when we think about how the death penalty is prescribed and enacted. A lot of people who are being put to death in our country are very poor, are not able to uh, hire legal representation the way they should. And we need to make sure our government does not have bloody hands upon them. But there you see the idea of capital punishment. And the reason I brought that up is I want us to look at that idea from the aspect of the sanctity of life. The reason the Lord allows such laws to be passed is because he recognizes how precious life is. We go a little bit later. Look at the letter T. And the reason I put the letter T there is I wanted us to talk for a second about teaching. Teaching other people. In Romans chapter 13, excuse me. Yeah, let's see. The Romans 10, I'm sorry. Got my letters confused. In Romans chapter 10, looking at verse 14, we see Paul as he's discussing the nation of Israel. And what's interesting is oftentimes when we're studying the book of Romans, we, boy, we really concentrate on those first eight chapters. And then we start in chapter 12 and we concentrate on that and go to the end. And hardly ever do we really focus on 9, 10, and 11. But this is powerful stuff from Paul. He opens up that passage and he says, Brethren, my heart's desire for Israel is that they may be saved. But they are not saved. They have a zeal, but it's not a zeal according to knowledge. And he's talking about Israel. And the question is, especially back at that time, but even today, is how can God's people no longer be God's people? How could God make a promise to Abraham? How could God make a promise to David? And now in the Christian age, Israel no longer has its perceived status was because they fell away and because they were unfaithful. And so as we look at that passage, we see where Paul talks about the olive branch representing Israel now being grafted with the Gentiles. And now that those Gentiles are grafted within that root, which is Abraham, we are made to be children of Abraham. And now we are recipients of that promise. But Paul says the Gentiles better be careful because it's possible for us to lose our salvation as well if we're not faithful. And so as he goes through there in chapter 10, he uses many different statements which denominational folks and other folks misuse. He makes a statement talking about how we'll be saved if we will only confess Jesus Christ as Lord. Now, is that passage true? Absolutely is true. Does that mean today all that someone has to do is say the sinner's prayer? That's not what it's talking about. What was the stumbling block for Israel? What was it that was keeping the physical children of Abraham from being the children of God any longer? They had rejected the rabbi. They had rejected the Messiah. And they had turned away from Jesus. And so what Paul is getting at as he goes through there in Romans chapter 10 is he's saying if they will get over that stumbling block, if they will begin to follow the Messiah and obey the Messiah and obey the plan of salvation, then they will be saved. But there's that stumbling block that they have to recognize that Jesus is there. Going a little bit later from verses 9 and 10, which we're talking about, we see where he talks about the importance of teaching people about Jesus. And he goes through this passage and he says, How shall they hear unless someone preaches to them? And how shall that preaching happen unless someone goes to them? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. Now I've hung out with a lot of preachers and they've got some ugly feet. You know what I mean? I don't know if they have uglier feet than anybody else, but I've just seen a lot of preachers' feet and they're hardly ever pretty. What's this passage talking about? Not physical, beautiful feet. It's talking about the joy of someone who's bringing glad tidings. 
Maybe you grew up in an old creaky house. That's where I grew up. We had an old creaky house. Sorry, Mom. It was kind of creaky. Yeah, I know. All right. But one of the memories I always enjoyed was laying there in bed. I didn't like getting up in the morning. But I always remember when the parents would get up, usually it was Dad, and he would come down the hallway and he would get the coffee started. And for me, that was like, okay, here's your 10-minute warning, all right? Because in 10 minutes, the coffee's going to be ready and it's going to be time to get up. But it's a joyful memory. It's one of those things I think about when I think about my childhood, and especially when I think about that house, is the creaking of those boards as a loved one is working his way through. Now, my dad did not have pretty feet, but it brings a joyful memory of mine to think about him walking down those creaky boards coming across this house and coming up and down the hallways. Maybe you remember it as a squeaky door. You ever have one of those doors in the house when it opened, you knew which door it was because it had a certain squeak, something like that. And maybe those bring back good memories. That's what Paul's talking about when he says how beautiful are those feet that come and preach the gospel of peace. And he says we need to remember the importance of teaching other people. Well, we in the church don't like teaching other people sometimes because what if you go up to somebody and you invite them to church and they say, well, okay, what's your, doc- what's your view on transubstantiation or consubstantiation? You think, oh, my goodness. Okay. Or what's your view on the Holy Spirit and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? And you think, oh, my goodness. And we're afraid, we're afraid that if we invite somebody to church, we're going to get in a huge religious debate and just not know the answers at all. Sometimes we don't want to invite people because we're afraid of being rejected. What if I invite somebody and they say no? Oh, man, that'll be the end of the world. And a lot of times we're afraid to invite someone. We need to invite people because we recognize how precious life is. Every soul that you see, whether it be in your family, whether it be at work, whether it be at school, every soul has been paid for by Jesus Christ and is considered special by God. Every single person, even those people in line in front of you at Walmart who just won't seem to move because I always pick the wrong line, every single one of those people is special and needs to hear the gospel of Christ. Jesus gives us a promise in Mark 16. He says, He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. He who does not believe shall be condemned. That's a promise. And it's a promise that he'll keep. We have an obligation to let every person make a choice whether he will obey or whether he will disobey. Too many people are going to be lost because they've never heard the truth, because they've never heard the gospel. Make your feet special. And make people remember years later the thought of you walking up with the courage to invite them to church. With the, encur- with, with the courage to have a religious conversation with them. Because when you become an evangelist, when you teach other people the gospel, when you take that step to invite them, to show them God's love, you are recognizing the sanctity and the beauty of their life. And so teaching is very, very important. Now let's look at our next one, the letter I. Uh, it's kind of a buzzword. I just put it up there because it's the only I I could think of. Income equality. And what I mean by this is there's different people in society. One thing we oftentimes will notice about churches is many congregations have everybody who looks just alike. You ever notice that? I did when I was down in Mississippi. We had all white churches and all black churches. And we worked hard where I was to have an integrated church. That was hard work. It was difficult to do sometimes because... Not just because of the color, not really because of race, but because of culture. That was difficult to do. We see even here in Marshall County sometimes, you have congregations which some are wealthy, some are poor. But oftentimes within a congregation, most people will look alike. Why is that? Because we're comfortable around people who look, who think, and who act like us. You see, this is a modern problem. But it was also an ancient problem as well. In James chapter 2, verses 1 through 9, we see where there's a problem even in the early church. James is one of the first books written in the New Testament. And in this passage, we see that some people were having trouble because when they were popular and rich, they were given a choice seat. And those who were not popular and those who were not rich were put in the corner so nobody would see them. 
And James, by the inspiration of the scripture, says, Brethren, such a thing should not be so. Don't you realize we're all one under the grace of God? Don't you realize that those whom you're honoring, the rich and the wealthy and the popular, are often the ones who persecute you and hurt you? Recognize Jesus died for all people. Paul says similarly in Galatians 3 and 28. He says, listen, in the Lord's church there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, but we are all one in Christ Jesus. A verse earlier, he says, For as many as have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been clothed with Christ Jesus. And what he's getting at there in Galatians is the problem that's happening in the book. Jewish Christians are saying, hey, we are higher, we are more noble than these Gentile Christians who are here. And these Gentile Christians are going to have to do extra work in order to get where we are. Do we have a problem like that in the Lord's church today? Sometimes people don't want to come to church because they say they don't dress as well as everybody else. And they think we're binding something on them to say, not only do you have to obey the gospel of Christ, but you also have to do these things as well to be acceptable to us. Some people say, well, I can't fit in the Lord's church because of the sin in my life. And even if Jesus forgives my sin, my history makes it where I can't get there. And so they think that not only do they have to obey the gospel of Christ, but they also have to do other things in order to reach the level which we are today. Some people say, well, I don't fit in with those people because of their wealth or because of their popularity or whatever else it may be. And so they think we're teaching that not only do they have to obey the gospel of Christ, but they also have to move up to other levels as well. And as Paul and as James says, brethren, such a thing should not be. Those are not the things that the church is based upon. Think about it. Luke 15. How's that, how's that chapter start? The Pharisees and scribes were upset because Jesus was talking to sinners, to tax collectors, and to prostitutes. They thought these people aren't worthy of the gospel. And so Jesus gives the parable of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost boys. Not the lost boy, the lost boys. Each parable emphasizes how precious and special each and every person is. Now, how do we apply that to today? Talk to somebody different than you. Be sure after church, not only just to talk to your family, not only just to talk to the people around you, but find someone who's older than you and talk to them. Find someone who's younger than you and talk to them. Find someone who's different than you and talk to them. Now, don't all of y'all come talk to me and say I'm different. Because that'll make me paranoid. But find somebody different and spend time with them. Get to know them. Show them that you love them. And show them that you recognize their sanctity of life. The letter F represents family. We see many passages in the Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter 19 and verse 14 reminds us where Jesus says, Let the children come to me for such is the kingdom of heaven. We see in Matthew 18 where Jesus says... If any one of you causes a young one to stumble, it would be better for him to have had a millstone thrown around his neck and to be thrown into the sea. It's pretty serious right there, isn't it? You see the importance here of raising children to God. The importance of showing your love for Christ within your marriage. Notice what Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4 says. And you fathers do not provoke your children unto wrath, but instead bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. You show your respect for God in the way that you treat people in your family. You know, they know you better than anybody else, don't they? They can recognize your Christianity better, better than anyone else. And so they need to see your love for God and they need to see your love that you have for one another. Treat children with respect and with love. It's very important. The last letter to look at for us tonight is the letter Y. And that represents you. Now, why would I put you up there? Because each and every one of us, whoever you may be, is special in the sight of God. We see where God in that first day created light. We see where God created the world. We see where he created the stars, the moon. We see where he created the fish and the fowl. We see where he created every single animal. And every time he created those things, he said, it is good. <clears throat> but he saw there was something missing. And so he created man and he created woman. 
And as you and I read about that, we see that they're different than the animals. They're different than the water. They're different than the stars. They're different from the light. Because he says, let us make man in our image. Now that's the word, the word man is not talking about gender. It's talking about mankind, people. We are made in the image of God. And once he places man and woman upon this earth, he then says it is very good. Now what's that teach us today? No matter what anyone says about you, no matter what anyone thinks about you, no matter if people think you are disposable or not, you are special. We're only given 24 hours in a day. We're only given seven days in a week. We're only given approximately 30 days in a month. And we're only given around 365 days in a year. It's amazing how quickly time passes. And there's a lot of people who waste time because they do not recognize the sanctity and the preciousness of life. As we get ready to leave this building tonight, what I would like to invite every one of us to do is recognize our life and how precious it is. Don't waste time in foolish arguments. Don't waste time in broken relationships. Give yourself to the Lord and give yourself to others in showing love and compassion and the example of Jesus. You see, God said to Jeremiah, I formed you and I have a purpose for you. David, by the inspiration of Scripture, says, even though I'm smaller than this world and the stars in the heavens that are up there, Psalm 8, I recognize my place in this creation. David also says in Psalm 139, I am fearfully and wonderfully made. You are special. And so let's be sure to live in reflection of the gift that God's given to us. Tonight, if the invitation applies to you, if you need to obey the gospel, or if you need the prayers of the saints, we invite you to come forward as we stand and as we sing.
been handed an announcement that I need to make before we close tonight. Martha Forrest, the sister-in-law of Theresa Cotham and June Cotham, passed away at her home last night. She is the mother of Joan Beck, who many of you may know here in Benton, and the services will are tentatively set for Wednesday at Phil Beck. So we need to remember the Martha Forrest family this week. 